Good morning, good morning, good morning. And it's a lovely grey day. An autumnal day. I finally managed to get everything working properly. I'm not going to turn left because that road will be flooded. And I'm not going to turn left here because that road is going to be closed. So, this is like a battle royale. The circle is closing around me. If you're not a computer gamer, you won't know what that reference is to. So, the old videos are flying. They're flying up onto the YouTube. I think I posted three or four yesterday. I think four. One modern one and two old ones. One of the old ones was a duplicate of another one, the one that was already posted about four years ago. Because uh, I uh, had the uh, half the footage in one directory and half the footage in another directory, so I did it twice without noticing I was making the same video for, or two videos for the same day. So I can't believe in 2018 I recorded so much stuff and. Uh, and didn't post it. I think it was because obviously things were going on at surgery. We were making people redundant. We were only booked up one, two days a week. No. Anyway, I'm pleased to report things are much better now. And we're booked up uh, quite happily, you know, for a week or two ahead, which is my optimum period. We're getting. Uh, Patients referred to us from other dentists, which is, uh, you know, there's a particular dentist in Broadstairs that's sending us patients. Which is, um, you know, unusual, but good. I don't mind. I do worry a bit about the impression that patients get when they're told, you know, I think they're told, you know, they'd like to come to this dentist in Broadstairs and they're told like we're unfortunately we're not accepting new patients but there is a dentist in Ramsgate that is a good dentist who is taking on new patients and the only circumstances under which you'd normally expect that is if a good dentist just set up new building there look new house new house yeah if a new dentist just set up and uh and, and, you know, you were lucky enough to get in at uh, a point when they were, uh, their books were open, the list was open. But in fact, as I explain to patients when they come in, I mean, the other, the other art, which is the far more worrying interpretation of that, is that this dentist is not as good as everybody says, and uh, uh, he hasn't got a waiting list because he's either horrendously expensive or he's really, really terrible. So uh, it's a bit worrying when, uh, you know, if, if a patient comes in and says, and you say, how did you hear about us? And they say, well, I rang around 10 dentists and you were the only dentist that could see me in the next week or so. And you think, well, what's different about us? You know, why are we an outlier in that respect? And I think, well, the way, the way what I tell myself is that we are just extremely efficient. We are, um, because of our policy of charging two days in advance, our utilisation is extremely high. Our fail to attend ratio is zero. And so really our utilisation uh, is, is as good as the demand. So if we've got demand for 85% of our appointments, then our utilisation is at 85%. It's not reduced by any factor on account of no-shows. And that's what our utilisation is, uh, is about 85%. One of the questions we ask when patients uh, ring up is, uh, you know, we just give them like a little, like a little pop quiz. 
one question and it just says, would you prefer to have a low cost and high speed and not worry about the quality? Or would you prefer to have a high cost and high quality and not worry about the speed? Or do you want high quality and high high speed and not worry about the cost? And uh, it tells you a bit about uh, patients in overall. I mean, basically, it's a little bit of a trick question because nobody ever says they want low quality. Nobody ever says they want high speed and low cost and they're not worried about the quality. Nobody says that. So really, it becomes a choice between uh, speed over cost. Do they want speed or do they want cost? And so that that's, that tells you a lot about um, the sort of patient they are. You know, what are they, what are their, what do they expect out of the treatment? So if someone says they want uh, speed and not worried about the cost, then you can assume that they are reasonably wealthy and that money's not going to be an issue for them too much, uh, and they've got a problem and they just want it fixed. Um, and these people, like everybody, if you give them exactly what they want, which is a quick solution, then then money is the least of their worries. And then you've got the other people who um, prefer cost over speed. And they're the people who, like if you've got, they ring on a Friday and you've got an appointment on a Tuesday, you don't need to give them that appointment on the Tuesday. Because they're actually one they won't mind mating a week two weeks three weeks or something providing you do them a good deal on keeping the expenses under control and these are possibly people who you know uh never been to a private dentist or what want to go to a private dentist but but struggle with the uh expense and so that and they are a completely different group of people you know, I mean, we are lucky in a way that um, our, my target market now and for a long time has been the wealthy, the well-off. Uh, in terms of the vertical market segmentation, we are we are firmly planted in in the private private sector, um, and so as a result, our clients are not uh, overly affected by the the sh sort of shambles that the uh, passes for the economy these days. Excuse me. But um, no, we've just had a, a Jeremy Hunt, who was a much unloved and, and, and pretty useless uh, Secretary of State for Health for a long time. Um, and, you know, just presided over the, the NHS pretty well sailing onto an iceberg of uh, uh, mismanagement and overspending. And, uh, has now now been rewarded by being put in charge of the whole country's finances, and uh, he's he's come up with a his first budget, which was you know always going to be an interesting uh, budget because, but not for the reasons that is being covered by the mainstream media. Mainstream media is all over, you know. Old uh, so and so's ringing in from Nottingham, who wonders how he's going to fill his car up, how he's going to turn the heating on, etc. Whereas for for sort of the macroeconomist, the, the question is far more interesting: is what in what direction are they going to sail? You know, we don't we don't worry about whether or not people on the boat are going hungry. We worry about whether the boat is is sailing south to the uh, you know to the fertile plains where food can be found, or whether it's sailing north uh, into the Arctic and and probably onto an iceberg. And the answer to that question is is pretty definitely we're sailing north onto an iceberg because he's not really uh, grasped at a macroeconomic level the decisions that he needs to take to sort things out. And the main one being obviously, you know, to, to abolish price control. And uh, I don't just mean price control of money through the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee that sets the price of borrowing money but also uh, you know he's now they're now setting the price of fuel by capping the uh, unit price although not the your total bills not capped but your unit price is capped 
um, the capping, uh, uh, the subsidising all sorts of other stuff. They're um, capping in a way what you can spend on recruiting staff. You know, you, you're not allowed to take on staff unless they earn £10.50 something uh, an hour. And if they can't contribute £10.50 an hour to the business, then it's not cost effective to take them on. And so someone who's like, oh, yay, my, you know, the minimum wage is going up. Um, good, you know, good for me. Well, the answer is it's not good for you because you and people like you will will be unemployable and will remain unemployable all the time they push the minimum wage up. They're lifting the bar that you have to jump to find an employer who's willing to take you on. And, uh, you know, it's not it's not about uh, sweatshop employees. I mean, I'm not saying there aren't any sweatshop employees who, uh, you know, don't, uh, you know, where, where the employee wages aren't lifted. I'm sure there are some places that will pay two pounds an hour if they could. But the point is that if you... Uh, if you can, you know, this is why I, what I say, people are always pay what they're worth. If you are, uh, the only job you can get is either no job or two pound an hour job, then you may be better off taking the two pound an hour job. Um, and then what happens is that obviously fairly quickly, a four pound an hour job will come along. And so you'll quit the four, the two pound an hour job and, and take the four pound an hour job. And the bloke who's trying to pay you two pounds is going to find he's got no staff. And if you're constantly developing your skills, in other words, even manual workers have got skills, you know, even uh, people who work in factories stitching garments for Primark have got stitching skills. And if you develop your skills, then, um, you know, your your value to the employer will increase. And, the, and as a result, your wages will increase. And you're just in competition with other people who've got the same skills as you. Um, wages will find their own level. You can't uh, do as the, uh, you know, as the nurses and the train drivers and the postmen are now currently trying to do, just go to an employer and say, we'd like to earn X and we're going to go on strike. Well, you know, I mean, the answer to that is, well, go on strike then. Go on strike. And if you're uh, the value, you know, if you're... Uh, If you're if you can capable of causing enough economic damage to your employees, your employers, to justify your wage increase, in other words, if it's going to cost them less to pay you more than it would to uh, deal with a strike, then um, they'll pay up. And that's again, it's like a free market. But saying saying that as they have done with the nurses that what they're asking for is unaffordable. He's not, uh, you know, I mean, that's just wishes, isn't it? What do they say about wishes? The, you know, I I can say what I'd like to earn. I mean, I can say what I'd like to earn. It doesn't mean I'm going to get anywhere near earning it. No one's going to give it to me. And employers can say what they'd like to pay. And the wage, uh, the payroll at the end of the month is the consequence of both people wanting to do what they want to do, isn't it? I think, um, you know, having led a national union through a, a national strike um, and, and an unpopular one as well, I mean, you know, who's who was really sympathetic to the dentists uh, wanting more money? I think probably with hindsight, that was the only way we mismanaged that. We we made it, you know, it, it, we allowed it to turn into a debate about dentist pay, whereas in fact it wasn't. It was a debate about the future of NHS dentistry. Um, we should have said that we're going, you know, we don't want an increase in pay, but we want uh, more money for fees <clears throat> because otherwise the NHS is going to collapse. And then the government just said, well, you know, you're well paid. You can afford to take a reduction in fees. Uh, that's what I think that's how it boiled down because they're masters in manipulation, you know, what you, uh, the public is never, is easily swayed, very easily swayed. 
and never <clears throat> really is uh, privileged to have a proper debate on anything. Um, so, for example, where the nurses are asking for 10% to cope with inflation and 5% uh, to make up for the years in which they you know, been asked to accept below inflation pay rises to bring them up to some sort of uh, purchasing power parity with their even 10 years ago. And so that all adds up to 15%. And the government just says that's not affordable. You know, that's not affordable. And it's. And yet, yeah, it's not even an increase. They're not even asking. Even that 15% is not an increase in their pay. It's an increase in the you know the number, but it's not in terms of purchasing power. It's really only just getting them back to where they were ten years ago. <clears throat> They're not going on strike for a pay increase. They're going on strike just to be kept, you know, to to stop drowning, stop themselves going below the waves, <clears throat> the waves of inflation. So uh, the the government, while you know, immediately agreeing that house prices uh, can float and and be put up uh, as as the pound buys less, and agreeing that commodities can go up and uh, to uh, you know maintain their uh, their value, uh, their, their purchase price, even as inflation goes up, that they have this the sticking point about the. Um, the working man's wages, what he charges for his, you know, his labour. And they're like, oh, no, that can't go up because that's where the, that's, that's the, they're the people who are going to have to pay. And when the government prints money and uh, spends it out of nowhere, out of thin air, money, that money, someone has to pay for that. <laughs> and the person who's going to pay for it is the, the person who's uh, basically, all they've got to do is sell their labour. And they're being told in no uncertain terms that their standard of living is going to shoot right down. And we're forecast to have a, go back to 10 years ago in terms of what they you know were earning and what they could buy. It's 10 years of you know pretty pathetic, anemic progress is now going to be wiped out. We're going to have two years of extremely hard uh, times and then eight years of just hard times. But this is the government's Keynesian playbook. Keynes, it's a, it's a massive battle for, between two philosophies, Keynes and, and the Austrian school, the Chicago schools. Um, and uh, the government prefer Keynes. Keynes is not, did not have the right approach, but the government prefer him because Keynes said, when things are going bad, you have to spend money. And the government like that. You know, they like the idea of if they've cocked things up, then they've got a famous economist who uh, uh, said that they they should uh, not worry about, you know, spend now, worry about it later. Uh, but they never, ever do the other half of what King suggested, which was in times when times are good, um, they should destroy money. They should unprint it. They should buy back their IOUs and not write more IOUs to pay back the IOUs, but actually just buy back the IOUs. And and they for, conveniently forget that bit. And it's deliberate. I mean, it's not that they forget it. I mean, they ignore it. They like they they do the spending bit, but they don't do the unspending bit. So that's why Keynesianism is so bad when it's exercised by governments. The Austrian school, the Chicago school, are the school that you and I would recognise. That's the school that your bank manager <laughs> recognises. You know, you borrow some money, you've got to pay it back. And it's no use uh, saying, uh, you know, I owe you £5,000. Is it all right if I have a £5,000 loan to pay you back my £5,000? Your bank manager would say, no. Our, our agreement was you would pay the £5,000 back. So... <laughs> Or a ten thousand pound loan to pay back the five thousand, which is the way the government does it. So of course the government doesn't like that, you know. Do they not like that? So, so you won't see much in the way of uh, 
balancing of the budgets, despite all the palaver and the hoo-ha about we're taking hard decisions and we're supporting the poor, basically it was a budget that spent a ton of money. You know, it extended the fuel subsidy. It's getting there, giving away money now uh, to people. Uh, 100 here, 500 there, 1,000 there, 900 there. Um, they are doing it in a way which is uh, a lot of critics of Keynes, even critics of Keynes would, would agree it's probably a better way of doing it because they, 2008, they basically gave all, all the money to the banks and said, look, here you are, guys, you know, just build up your reserves, um, get yourself back into some sort of solvency situation and uh you know you're welcome and and the banks then uh stuck all that money in their reserves and it didn't really help the economy much nobody because um uh, nobody saw any of it you know they had to the banks had to step in and say look we've given you a ton of money you've got to start lending a bit out uh, and it was only the government owned lloyd's bank really that they got enough leverage over to um, uh, to to force them to make loans to punters like me and you, um, and that's who I borrowed the money off to set the surgery up in um, in 2015. But uh, banks don't like retail business, you know. They don't honestly. They don't. They don't want branches. They don't want cashiers. They don't want people coming in and saying. Um, you know, I'm seven pound overdrawn. Can I have a ten pound overdraft for a week? They just don't want that. They would prefer to be dealing, wheeling, and dealing on the stock exchanges and the foreign exchange markets and making their money. They can make more money in a single day on the foreign exchange markets than they'll make through their entire retail arm. You know, so they they do it because they're called banks, and that's what people think banks always the banks should do. And obviously people do need retail customers, do need some sort of financial facility, don't they? They need the little loan for their ironing board or they need a, a new washing machine or something. So what the government is doing is the government is giving people money directly. They're not giving it to the banks now. They're giving it to people uh, in the hope that, um, first of all, it will buy them boats. And secondly, you know, make it look like they're doing something. And thirdly, that it will get spent, that people will... When they get their, you know, uh, sixty-six pounds off their gas bill, which everyone's getting, including me, um, the electricity bill, that they, they'll and it's called helicopter money, because basically it's like and Ben Bernanke used to talk about this, the ex uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve, uh, that you know it's like sending someone up in a helicopter with a massive great pallet of money and just getting him to throw it out the window in handfuls. Um, that's the way to. That they're thinking that it's the way to sort of get the get the economy going. But there was a guy from Legal and General this morning on Radio Four, and he said basically the uh, UK is a low growth, low wage economy, and and it's a pretty you know all over it's a pretty depressing job, and any attempts to try and uh, spur growth have um, failed. This growth, massive uh, growth, you know, agenda and ambitions were quashed pretty quickly. Uh, Rishi Sunak, when he was Chancellor, brought in this 120% capital allowance, whereby if you spent 50000 on an OPG, you used to get 60000 back, something along those lines. Nobody really, I don't think any, I mean, I certainly wasn't tempted. You've still got to pay for it, you know, I mean, you may not have to pay tax on it, and you may not have to pay tax on a bit of other stuff as a result of buying it but you've still got to pay for it and it's a bit you know we're a bit like an oil refinery in a way you know why why would an oil why would someone who could fund an oil refinery why would they fund one against the backdrop of everybody saying that oh we're phasing oil out it's now is not the time to invest in an oil refinery and as a result we've got this massive diesel shortage um, a lot you know a lot in america showing up first where things tend to show up first in america and uh petrol and diesel which up until about a month ago were pretty well you know moved in tandem at the pumps um are now um 
30 pence a part was you know you could pay like 178 for petrol and 181 for diesel and now it's 164 for petrol and 197 for diesel and that's that's a big divergence you know where yeah. most people have not ever seen that before it makes i mean diesel cars fortunately i think are a bit more fuel efficient but it's um it's you know it's a, that is a way to stop people driving diesel cars is just force them to pay 30 pence a litre more for the fuel so so what's the takeaway from the budget what's the big takeaway well the big takeaway is that the mm -hmm. The attitude and the actions that caused the problem, the uh, Keynesian the spend now, worry about it later type economics, is alive and well. And there's going to be absolutely no change at all in that. And what they've done is uh, Hunt has spent a ton of money. Um, he's frozen uh, uh, personal allowances. He's reduced capital gains tax uh, allowances from 12 to 6 and then and then down to three in a few years so you know which is an which is outrageous because someone who's got an asset you know let's say an asset worth a hundred thousand and then they double the money supply and so all of a sudden it takes two hundred thousand of these devalued pounds to buy the same asset which hasn't changed at all is exactly the same asset and all of a sudden, this person who owns this asset is told that they've um, they've got to pay capital gains tax because they've made a gain, that the asset's gone up in value. But it hasn't gone up in value, it's just gone up in price. It hasn't gone up in value at all. There is no capital gain. Uh, and uh, Milton Friedman, who was a vocal um, Austrian at Chicago school uh, economist, said that... Uh, capital gains tax should be um, adjusted for inflation because an inflationary gain, a gain caused by the fact that the money's been debased is not a gain and he's, he was absolutely right on that it's just another way for the government to steal money off you and the government is, is stealing money now, you know, by not increasing uh, rates uh, personal allowances and things like that for the next six years, they're not going to raise anything until eventually that, you know, as soon as you uh, buy a ham sandwich, you're going to start paying for it. So this sort of high spending, high tax, high spending uh, approach is, is alive and well. And any idea that the government might... Uh, Put the big measures in place to fix it, such as uh, meaningful reduction in government expenditure, meaning meaningful reduction in uh, entitled benefits, uh, and uh, a return to a money which was tied to something tangible that couldn't be debased. You know, not necessarily the gold standard. I don't care. They put themselves on the copper standard, the Bitcoin standard. I don't care if they put themselves on the anything standard, as long as the anything can't be printed at will. But there's no sign of that on the horizon. So there we go. What's the that's the that's the situation. More of the same, only worse. You know. Sorry, it can't be more good news. But I mean, that's that was the answer, wasn't it? That was the answer we're looking for. What's it going to be? Are we going to go for more of the same and worse, or are we are we going to strike out towards the fertile uh, fertile plains? And we're not we're going to see a fertile plain, I'm afraid. All right, well, not for the next ten years, anyway. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.